Welcome to this review, which continues building on our previous discussion uh, for the short run unit. And today we're going to focus on the Keynesian cross, which is a simplified uh, model of aggregate demand that emphasizes fiscal factors. Specifically, it emphasizes how changes in government spending or alternatively changes in taxes could influence uh, equilibrium output. So this contrasts with the previous model we studied that emphasized how changes in the money supply could influence output. The starting point for this model is this concept of planned expenditure, which we'll denote PE, which is the sum of the components that um, you, would, you would spend money on in the economy. And for simplicity, we're focusing on a closed economy in this unit, so there's no NX. It's just C plus I plus G. In a previous course, you might have called what we're calling planned expenditure here aggregate expenditure. So if you prefer that term, it's the same thing, so um, what, whatever makes life easy. So for each of these three components, we'll want to you know, sort of specify in more detail how it works. For C, we'll try to use just the simplest consumption function we can think of. So we'll put what we call a simple C. And we know, of course, in real life, people's choices about how much to consume depend on lots of factors. But probably a really important one is going to be your disposable income. So we'll make consumption a function of disposable income, or income after taxes, y minus t. And the simplest function I could think of would be one that's just a straight line. It'll have some basic level of consumption that you, you consume no matter what, C bar, that's like what you have to eat to survive, plus some marginal propensity to consume multiplied by that disposable income. Um, so that's our consumption function. Then for I and G, we're going to make things even simpler. We're just going to make these exogenous. So I will equal some fixed amount of investment that's predetermined, G will equal some fixed amount of uh, government purchases that's predetermined, and consumption depends on taxes, so we need to specify taxes too. Taxes will also be exogenous, so taxes equal T bar are exogenous. So now we've specified our planned expenditure in detail, each of the three components, and we could sort of list them out. Um, so we want to start thinking about equilibrium. And it looks like, you know, how could we think about equilibrium? We only have one equation so far in this model. Don't we usually need at least two? But it turns out that we don't really need two in this case, or, or I guess the equilibrium gives us our second one. The equilibrium is just that the actual amount spent on expenditure needs to equal the planned amount of expenditure. So the, and the actual amount of expenditure is your GDP, right? Your real GDP. So this is actual expenditure equals planned expenditure. So what we can do now is we could think of this model, this equilibrium condition, in terms of a graph, which is what gives the, uh, the model the name, the Keynesian cross, but I don't find that actually particularly helpful. So what instead we're going to do is try to think more about this equilibrium in algebraic terms. We'll combine y equals PE as one equation with the equation we had above for planned expenditure, and um, we'll see what we can do with that algebra. So I've written out the uh, first step. I've plugged in for planned expenditure on the right, uh, plugging in for C, I, and G. So we get C bar plus MPC times disposable income plus I bar plus G bar. And then I've distributed some terms on the, uh, the, the second row. So uh, what we see is at the second row, we have Y's on both sides of the equation. So that's not good. So what we'll like to do is subtract that MPC Y from both sides to get Y minus MPC times y on the left, and then the right now is all in terms of exogenous variables. It is uh, g bar plus c bar plus i bar minus mpc times t bar. And the left hand side, we'd like to simplify that down to just y, so let's see what we can do. We'll get 1 minus mpc times y, and then we'll divide both sides by 1 minus MPC. The 1 minus MPC cancels, but then we'll have to divide the right-hand side by 1 minus MPC. So we end up getting 1 over 1 minus MPC times G bar plus that same coefficient 1 minus 1 over 1 minus MPC times C bar plus I bar minus MPC over 1 minus MPC times T bar. And what we'll mostly focus on here, even though there's lots of terms, is this 
a g term, and specifically the coefficient on g, we call this the g multiplier because it tells us for every $1 increase in g in that exogenous variable g, how much does y increase? It's basically delta y over delta g. Um, and what we'll notice is that MPC in general is going to be bigger than 0 but less than 1. So since MPC greater than 0, we'll have 1 over 1 minus something bigger than 0. So 1 over something smaller than 1 is going to be bigger than 1, which means the G multiplier in general is going to be bigger than 1. Which makes sense. I mean, you know, based on the name, it sounds like it's multiplying something, right? So for every one dollar increase in G, we're gonna have a. It's gonna be multiplied by this G multiplier and generate a more than one dollar increase in income. That's one of the important conclusions of this Keynesian cross model because it suggests that if we want to increase output, and really. What we have in mind when we say output here is we, we mean aggregate demand. And then when you increase aggregate demand, the new equilibrium with aggregate supply will be bigger. So if we want to increase uh, aggregate demand, we can do that by increasing government spending because it'll have a multiplier effect and you'll get this big increase in aggregate demand. So it seems like a good tool. The other thing we could notice from inspection of this equation is that there's also a t multiplier. Changes in t also matter, and they might matter, you know, just like with g, they might matter more than one for one with the changes in t. So I want you to think about this as you read the book. The book discusses this in detail. What is the t multiplier? And can you see it in the equation above? Does it match what you read about in the, um, in the, in the book? So the last thing I want to talk about is that we derive the g multiplier using pure algebra, but you might wonder, you know, where did we get this equation? Does it actually make sense? You know, and why does a, a, a $1 increase in government spending not just increase expenditure by $1? Why does it have a more than, you know, $1 overall effect? Well, the intuition comes from this idea of the increase in expenditure is going to be $1 because the government spends a dollar at some store. And then we want to think about the down-the-road consequences. So suppose the government comes and spends $1 at my store. Um, there's a $1 increase in expenditure, so we've listed that here, $1 of expense, delta y is 1. But then because they spent money at my store, I have a new income of $1. So I put that in on this table at the bottom. And because my income has increased, I probably want to do some spending, right? Whenever my in income increases, I'm going to increase my consumption. But I don't spend the full dollar. For every dollar increase in income, I do uh, MPC dollars of spending on consumption. So my new spending is MPC. And that new spending then contributes to expenditure. So I need to add that up above. It's going to be 1 plus MPC so far. But of course, if I spent MPC dollars, I had to spend it somewhere. Maybe I spent it at your store. So in round two, you get that one, that MPC dollars of spending. MPC might be, say, 50 cents or something like that. And with that 50 cents, you're going to spend some fraction of it. You're going to spend MPC fraction of the MPC. So your new spending is going to be MPC times MPC or MPC squared. So now you've contributed MPC squared towards total change in spending. And that MPC squared was spent at someone else's store. So in round three, someone gets that MPC squared in new income, and they're going to spend some fraction of that. They're going to spend their MPC of that MPC squared dollar. So that's going to give us MPC of MPC squared is MPC cubed. And uh, we'll need to add that to the total spending. And this just sort of continues on forever. So we could go dot, dot, dot. It'll be plus MPC to the fourth, plus MPC to the fifth, and so on. And it turns out that if you, if you remember from your, your study of the geometric series, probably at some point in high school, this type of geometric series converges to 1 over 1 minus MPC. So that gives us the, the G multiplier. For a $1 increase in spending, the change in output is going to be 1 over 1 minus MPC, based on this simple model. It turns out that this analysis isn't really right. It emphasizes how if, I, if G increases, it leads to Y increasing, which leads to C increasing, which leads to Y increasing, which leads to C increasing. But it ignores that other things might change. Exports or imports might change. So this is a closed economy, so that won't happen. But in a real economy like the US, it would. Um, investment might change. Interest rates might change. Lots of things might change. So we're going to revisit this issue of the G multiplier throughout our study of the short run and try to get a more realistic take on it as we go through each step of the short run analysis. 
The simple formula here is important for you to know, and it's important to do sort of back of the envelope calculations, but you shouldn't take it literally as this is the actual right formula for the multiplier. It's too simplified.